The first speaker uh, is Inanna Hamati Ataya uh, from the University of Aberystwyth in Wales, a distinguished international relations theorist, who will discuss outline for a reflexive epistemology. Thank you, Steve. Um, so my talk is not going to be as exciting as Steve's and not as profound as Ilya's. It's part of um, what I'm working on, which is reflexivity. I'm going to explain what this means and what I mean by it, and, and then um, move to one particular aspect that I would like to discuss today, which is how does reflexivity change our understanding of epistemology and part of the nature and social role of the philosophy of science. And although I have a, a, a background and a training in the natural sciences, I'm going to focus especially on, on what epistemology means for the social sciences today. I've chosen some visual representations, hopefully, to give a, 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 an illustration for the different ways of looking at the world and of including the knowing subject in reality. So I hope they will speak to you. If they don't, just ignore them. Now, reflexivity is a, is a word, is a concept that is um, quite visible in the humanities and in, in the social sciences, even in economics, in fact. So I'm going to focus on the meaning of reflexivity mainly within the social sciences and specifically at two different levels, the ontological level and the epistemological level. Usually when we talk about reflexivity in the social sciences, we mean two things, one of two things or possibly two things simultaneously. The first one is that we talk about reflexivity when social actors produce their own reality. So. We use this term, for instance, in Anthony Giddens' um, social theory to mean that there is a process of co-constitution between actors and the social reality in which they are involved. Now, this is something that all reflexivists take on board, but some social scientists take this principle very seriously and move it from the ontological to the epistemological level and consider that if, as social beings, we are constantly involved in the production of the reality that we observe and within which we act, then obviously this is a principle that has a huge implication at the level of knowledge. And hence, it should be taken account in any theory of knowledge. So at the epistemological level, reflexivity means that any social scientist has to conceive of himself or herself as contributing to the so-called social construction of reality that is part of the process of knowing the world in a social scientific way. So there's an ontological reflexivity. Anthony Giddens, for instance, summarizes it as the mutual constitution of structure and agency. There's an epistemological reflexivity, and I take here French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's definition, or, or one of the dimensions that he mentions which is the implication of the fact that social science is a social construction of a social construction. So there is a doubling of the phenomenon of the co-constitution of basically thought and practice. I'm interested in epistemological reflexivity first because it is more coherent and more consistent, and secondly because it not only um, establishes itself as a standard for better social science, but also for more um, ethically improved social science, more moral social science, and hence more accountable social science. So unfortunately, in the social sciences and the humanities, not everyone moves from the ontological level to the epistemological level. In particular, in my field of study, political science, international politics, all the theories that claim to have some kind of social construction as background, or even some critical theory background in reference to the Frankfurt School, etc., they are very willing to accept the fact that social agents um, constitute the reality that they are um, uh, acting within, but they never really consider that this has huge implications for them as knowledge producers. So I take the maximalist understanding of reflexivity as being really a principle of social scientific research, and hence something that is going to affect epistemology, not only the nature of, of epistemology, but also the social function of epistemology. Now, to put it in very simplistic terms, I'm afraid, I'm going to define briefly reflexivity as a bending back, but also a bending forward of knowledge as praxis. And to understand or to try to convey 
why I think this makes a huge difference to epistemology. I'm going to go through the classical understanding of epistemology and the philosophy of science very briefly and focus especially on its normative, idealist, a priori, and foundationalist dimension. And to illustrate this, um, a famous painting by Rembrandt, The Anatomy Lesson, which also gives you the spirit of a whole epoch um, when man became both the subject and the object of knowledge, but managed very well to have the schizophrenic coexistence between the object of knowledge, man as the object being very much separated from man the subject. And so we could study ourselves in the same way that we studied nature, and indeed here we are part of nature, without ever considering how our knowledge of ourselves was socio-historically constituted, or how the fact that we were both subjects and objects changed this, um, this particular knowledge. So, part of the problem with classical epistemology is that it is considered a branch of normative philosophy, right? We are concerned within classical epistemology, within what we call analytical epistemology. I don't know to what extent it is influential in this institute. Uh, I have read that in the 70s it was very much the dominant um, epistemology here as well as in the United States. It is still dominant in the Anglo-American sphere, unfortunately despite the, the, the big advancement of what we call post-positivist or critical theories of knowledge. But the classical view is that we are thinking about the a priori rules that would help us distinguish between knowledge and opinion and between science and non-science. So we're interested in, in two main problems. The first one is the demarcation problem, which might seem obvious because we've all been through this learning of in the philosophy of science of the big demarcation problem, but it's not really obvious that this should be a problem in the theory of knowledge. And the second problem is about justification. How do we justify the truth value of our beliefs or of our statements? And mainly, classical epistemology is interested in the nature of knowledge and the sources of knowledge and the limits of knowledge. And I will, I will show later on that these three questions can have a very, very different meaning once we move epistemology out of normative philosophy into a, a more socio-historical understanding of knowledge. Now one of the problems of this approach is not only that it is a priori, that in fact it can speak of knowledge without ever interacting with knowledge as a real product of reality, without ever taking the ontological nature of knowledge seriously, without ever studying science or the sciences as they actually exist, without ever looking at scientific practice, without ever looking at thought as a, as a social activity and process. The problem is also that it is very highly idealistic in the philosophical sense, in the sense exactly that Marx and Engels used to critique that way of dealing with reality that is absolutely abstracted from reality. And the way that it does so is that it manages to reduce all the standards for the meaning of knowledge to the standards of validity of propositional knowledge. So basically, all the classical conversation happens at the level of the proposition as a unit, a linguistic unit. And the standards of validity are the standards of meaning of that propositional unit, and hence they are related to logic and not to socio-historical meaning. Now we know that this kind of epistemology and philosophy of science is solid in the sense that it is very vigorous because of foundationalism, because it gives us a foundation upon which to establish all knowledge claims from the most general to the most specific. And I distinguish two kinds of foundationalism. The first one is what I would call meta-epistemic foundationalism, which is basically the identification of normative standards for the foundation of knowledge itself, to be able to say that knowledge, there is such a thing as knowledge, and we can demarcate it from non-knowledge. And the other one is what I would call properly epistemic foundationalism, which is establishing the normative standards for the justification of our truth claims. So all epistemic foundationalists are meta-epistemic foundationalists, obviously, because they believe that knowledge is a meaningful thing, but then they will disagree on how to justify the specific validity of specific truth claims. Now, if one is is thinking within classical epistemology, then pro foundationalism is an answer to the problem of knowledge as foundationalism defines it. 
But if we step out of analytical epistemology and if we try to understand existentially why there is such a need for foundationalism and for this kind of epistemology, it becomes clear, as it was clear to people like Richard Worty or Richard Bernstein, that the problem really is a political, social, psychological, existential one. Foundationalism is coherent and logical, but more importantly, it provides a solution to the existential problem of our species having to deal with a very chaotic world, universe, I put it. And the idea that, of course, it is not possible for us to spontaneously find meaning in a world that is not already ordered. And hence, we need to order the world so that we can cope somehow with the chaos, with the non-existence of an a priori layer of meaning for us. Now, this is interesting because it changes then the question of what is the function of epistemology. It's not just its philosophical function, which is to uh, provide a theory of knowledge that demarcates knowledge from non-knowledge. But the social and social psychological function of epistemology is, of course, to stabilize us existentially. And so a fear of the loss of foundation is somehow a fear not just of chaos, but also of social madness. Now, you might be familiar with the different critiques of foundationalism, and, and foundationalism like objectivism and positivism has received many different critiques so many critiques from different angles that one really wonders why it is still standing and why it is so powerful still in the Anglo-American intellectual world. I'm not going to go into all of these critiques but simply mention some of them which you are probably familiar with. John Dewey's critique of the spectator theory of knowledge, Wilfred Seller's critique of the myth of the given, Quine's critique of the dogmas of empiricism, Hilary Putnam's critique of Descartes, um, whole paradigm through the pragmatist response he gave in, in the form of the brain in a vat argument. Richard Worty's um, um, critique which belongs to a whole death of epistemology movement which tries to deconstruct the socio-historical and ideological functions of epistemology as the first, um, the first discipline, the arbiter of all other forms of knowledge. And then I'm going to focus on two critical traditions vis-a-vis -vis epistemology, which I think should be much stronger than they currently are, and which I think also should be synthesized into one new reflexive theory of knowledge. The first one um, is a properly European continental tradition, which is basically um, Karl Marx and, Engel, and Marx and Engels meet French historical epistemology. So the first fundamental um, and very clear enunciation of the problems of analytical and idealistic epistemology is within Ideologie Critique, which was expanded by Karl Mannheim into Wissenssoziologie, where you were no longer talking about a specific critique of ideology within the capitalist system, but turning all systems of thought into what he calls total ideology, and hence moving from the critique of ideology to a sociology of knowledge. And this tradition meets the French tradition of historical epistemology, which is established by Gaston Bachelard and developed by um, French historians of science like uh, Georges Canguillem, Michel Foucault, who you are probably more familiar with, um, Louis Althusser, and also closer to us, Pierre Bourdieu. And this is a tradition which actually doesn't look at science with a capital S, like the Anglo-Americans look at science as if it were some kind of god, there is really a whole theology of science behind it. They look at real sciences in the plural, and they look at real, the real practices of scientists. And this is a way of gaining the autonomy of epistemology away from the philosophers. In other words, Gaston Bachelard wanted to uh, reject the philosophy of philosophers and ask the scientists, what is the philosophy of your own practice? And this is a tradition that develops very much with uh, Pierre Bourdieu, for instance, who considers that sociologists should become their own epistemologists, because they are the ones who understand the nature of their craft, the truly philosophical, but also empirical and social obstacles that they face while they are producing their research, and also those who can establish the axiological or normative meaning of what it means to be doing um, social science. 
Of course, close, much closer to us and closer even physically is Steve Fuller's um, socializing version of epistemology, social epistemology, which I consider to be fully within that uh, socio-historical tradition. The other tradition is, um, it's, I'm not sure it's a tradition actually, but it is um, the concept developed by Quine, naturalized epistemology. Now what is, what are the, 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 the common, what is the common ground between the two is that both of them are not looking at knowledge from a, an ideal and a priori um, foundation or perspective. They're looking at actual knowledge and they consider that it is possible to ask real questions about knowledge and questions about a real knowing subject, not an idealized, universal, abstract, non-existent knowing subject. Naturalized epistemology was meant to take knowledge out of the realm of philosophy and into the realm of cognitive psychology and say, well, instead of asking about the abstract, absolute difference between knowledge and non-knowledge, or about the way that we acquire knowledge, what it means to know, we should look at how people actually acquire uh, knowledge, that is, how do they actually acquire beliefs that, that they can claim to be true, and what are the obstacles to this. What is common between those two traditions is that both of them consider that we need to look at knowledge as a real socio-historical and also natural phenomenon. And once you bring in the notion of reflexivity, the question becomes, what are the conditions of possibility of knowledge? So it's no longer what is the absolute metaphysical nature of knowledge, but where does our knowledge come from? What is it that makes this particular or these knowledges possible? What is it that makes them potentially impossible? In other words, we're no longer looking at the subject of knowledge as an universal abstract subject with a capital S. We're looking at socio-historical subjects who are constituted through both natural processes of evolution, physiological, neurological, etc., but also, of course, socio-historical processes that will make different subjects differently situated in the world, producing very different kinds of knowledges that are all valid. And when I'm thinking, when I'm talking about knowledge, I'm not only talking about science or what we understand in the West today to be science, but I'm talking about knowledge as culture, which means that we should include, of course, our system of values. So it's not just knowing, but it's also judging the world and also all the practices um, that constitute what in the West today would not be considered absolutely as scientific uh, forms of knowledge. Now, I just said a few minutes ago that foundationalism played a very important psychological, social psychological and existential role for us, which is that it puts order in a world that is not naturally endowed with order. So, do we, do we only have the choice between two solutions, which is to just close our eyes and be blind to history and to society and just say, okay, we know that it's all relative, we know that knowledge is socio-historical, but it becomes much too complicated to include this variable. Let us just forget about this and let us just pretend that it is possible to speak of knowledge in the absolute. Because if we destroy this foundationalism, if we destroy the foundations themselves, then we are only faced with chaos, or as Nietzsche said, we're only faced with perspective. So there are some people who believe that it is not an either or, and that we can still destroy foundationalism as it exists, because it is in itself dangerous and, and, and just an illusion, and reconstruct a different foundation that does not follow the idealist a priori um, path that analytical epistemology and philosophy of science have chosen. Now, a way to do this is to think existentially of how it is possible to turn the anxieties that have produced foundationalism into positive anxieties for us. That is something that would anchor our ability to know and our necessity to know and to act in the world in a way that empowers us instead of just paralyzing us. But of course, the, the question becomes, why do we want epistemology in the first place? What do we want from epistemology? And I think this is a very important question because it signifies the shifting of the dif we shift from a different pl to a different plane once reflexivity is introduced. Once we start asking where do we come from as knowing subjects? How do we produce the knowledge that we produce? And what does that mean for us to be socio-historically situated? and to be acting in the world, not based on an absolute knowledge, but on a knowledge that is always the product of a specific time. So, 
The social function of epistemology, of course, once we ask this question, we are problematizing knowledge and we're problematizing the theory of knowledge itself. And this is what post-positivist or so-called post-positivist or post-structuralist scholars have done, which is to problematize knowledge not in, ter not in analytical terms, knowledge versus non-knowledge or opinion or error or bias, but in socio-political terms. In other words, we have to see epistemology and the philosophy of science as socio-political systems that order reality, and ordering reality is a very political process, it's a very political act that is always involved in processes of exclusion. You're always ordering something along a specific principle which excludes other principles, other voices, other potentialities for ordering the world. And of course, as social theorists have shown, whether they were talking about the problem of ideology or looking at the construction and, and the reproduction of social orders, one of the most political acts in society is precisely the act of producing the standards for what will count as legitimate knowledge. And epistemology is the queen science in doing that, right? It's, it sets itself as the absolute superior discipline that will not only say what is knowledge and what is not, but it will say what is a good standard for judging knowledge. So it is at the most meta level, the discipline that sort of governs everything else. And hence it is at the highest level, the most political of all activities, while at the same time claiming to be the most neutral. Now, if we don't want to give up on a theory of knowledge, we need to ask ourselves, why do we need a theory of knowledge in the first place? So this is my third illustration. I'm sorry, it's, it's not... It's not original at all, and I, and I really scratched my head because I, I, I tried to provide this to my students, to try to think of a good, a good painting that would explain all the things that have to do with the reflexivity for the subject, for the object, for the process of representation, and I kept trying several things. And I ended up coming back to this, which as a painting does not particularly appeal to me, but it is so rich, uh, and it has been commented on, and, and, and many, I'm not a, a, an art critic or any, uh, anything of the sort. But obviously we come back to it because it has so many layers, and because it allows us to ask many different questions about how we are located, um, and who we speak to, and, and, and also because there is so much about the social order and the hierarchies of societies inside that particular painting. So, what I'm interested in is saying that we should not throw away epistemology, we should critique it, we should destroy it as, as that claim to be positioned in a superior position vis-a-vis -vis all other forms of knowledge, but that we should sort of hijack it, we should turn it around, move it from the realm of normative philosophy into the realm of the social and historical sciences, but also the natural sciences. So, I think it is time for a new theory of knowledge, a new theory of knowledge that will really tell us how do we produce knowledge, how are we produced as knowing subjects, and that would take into account the two kinds of conditions that we are subjected to so far, as far as we know. We are subjected to natural conditions. We know that, for instance, children, um, the way that you raise a child is going to significantly um, change the neural pathways in their brain, right? Um, and very recently there have been some preliminary um, experiments on rats, but I'm hoping that they will be confirmed for human beings, that show that actually Darwin was wrong, Lamarck was right, which is very odd from the, pers from the point of view of the history of science and evolution, that it is possible for offsprings to inherit traits from their parents that are acquired traits and in particular, emotions uh, and hence memory. So it is possible for an offspring to have a genetic memory of an event that happened before it was even conceived. Now I have great hope that this kind of research can be pursued and that we can start thinking about how our historical and cultural developmental paths and the ways that different human communities have interacted differently with nature and with time and with culture and with language and with their experiences over generations might actually have impacted our very physiological material conditions for knowing. And I'm hoping that this would also tell us something about the way that we produce our system of values. Now I know it's very politically incorrect today, at least in the West, because of the history of that particular tradition of thought, 
to claim or even to hypothesize that specific cultures, because they interact with different climates and different natural environments, are going to have different traits. I know it's highly controversial, I know we don't want to go there, but in fact, let's, let's agree that it is a very legitimate question. And when you're reading the authors that predate all the idiocies that happened in the 20th century, not just in Germany or anywhere else, but even in America after the Second World War, where eugenics were actually very popular, but no one wants to talk about this. When you read about you know, the authors who were trying to think at that level, there are some very legitimate and reasonable explanations that they provide to explain why, for instance, um, Scandinavian communities have developed specific political values and how we can relate this to the way that they're organized and the way they divide their labor and how the way they divide their labor is based on their environment and the fact that they have to fish, to live, etc., etc. Now, what this tells us is that we can, we can try to think about nature and culture in more interesting ways and try to think about how this produces for us different potentialities for knowledge. How do different forms of political organization um, trigger or help us initiate different ways of knowing, different ways of feeling, different ways of assessing the world and also acting in it. And for me this holds great hopes because we are facing tremendous challenges and it doesn't seem that establishing a unified standard for knowledge, whether it is science or in other parts of the world, um, fundamentalist, thank you, um, religion or you know, whatever is happening in their la-la land, it doesn't seem to me that it is very reasonable to think in just one way. This is going to just, you know, if it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, we're all going to hit the wall. I'm very much, in fact, attracted to Paul Farabin's view that we should, on the contrary, um, multiply the ways through which we think about knowledge and, and the different ways that we educate ourselves to ask questions about the world. Now, reflexivity at a much more, at a less experimental level, at a much more rigorous level, is very important because it forces us to constantly ask about the frames of seeing that we use as scientists, especially as social scientists. It tells us that even these frames of seeing are constructed within specific uh, cultural and political orders. And hence, all the isms that we use, and especially that we use in the philosophy of science, and we think that they are the standard, these isms should constantly be interrogated because by using them, we are simply perhaps reproducing the socio-historical reality that brought them into being. And this is not a neutral act, and this is a very dangerous act, if only at the level of our pedagogy. Now, is it possible to sustain a long-term cognitive system without a foundation? Yes, because the foundation is reflexivity itself. As Pierre Bourdieu formulated it in very clear terms, you are simply, science is, is turning its own tools against itself, constantly checking itself, so that our study, our investigation of already made science is constantly helping us to produce a different science in the making. And it is our understanding of how we are constantly, always, always socio-historically situated that gives us the foundation. We don't need to start from the kind of strict foundation that was a completely created idea. Um, and we simply need to start educating ourselves from a, a different view, which doesn't start with any notion of foundation, but rather think about processes rather than a, a specific place that we're supposed to be located in. Ultimately, this also means that we can no longer think about knowledge as separated from values and also as separated from ethics. Um, now, I think Immanuel Kant was mentioned at least once today. I think he's the big bad guy. <laughs> or at least there is something that happened in, 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 the Western, in Western philosophy that suddenly made Kant's philosophy uh, just the big Bible. It sort of replaced Aristotle and we no longer needed to think outside of Kantian philosophy. But there is something very specific um, that Kantian philosophy did to European thought, which is that it erased all the previous traditions that were actually much smarter because they did not establish a, a, a separation between thought and practice. If we want to move away from epistemology and as a theory of knowledge, think about the theory of art. If you look at the theories of art in Europe, in France, for instance, before Kant, they were not philosophers' theories of art. They were artists' theories of art. They were doing exactly what Bachelard and Bourdieu want us to do as social scientists, which is to produce our own epistemology. 
and they were not at all under the, within this paradigm that thinks that there should be a norm for art, for the way you do art. It, it all had to do with asking very practical questions. And to do so, you have to be an artist. You have to be someone who is actually confronted with the obstacles of art in the same way that only a scientist can understand scientific practice because they are, on a daily basis, confronted with uh, the obstacles of practicing science. And my bet is that it is exactly the same in the realm of ethics, but this is still something that has to be demonstrated that Kant was absolutely wrong also in the way that um, he established his whole philosophy of ethics. And if we can simply reconnect these three fundamental faculties to know and to judge and to judge in two ways, to judge morally and to judge aesthetically and show that they are simply all the, the same kind of activity and that we have to move backwards, if you want, in a more Foucauldian genealogical way to recapture what it would mean to think and feel and assess the world in a way that does not separate knowledge or facts from values, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Okay, we have at least 10 minutes for questions. You ended five minutes early. Oh, good. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. For actually, actually I, I share, at least partly, your, your uh, critique or concerns about analytic philosophy and sympathetic. But I think the ironic thing is that analytic philosophy itself Right? If, if we follow your advice and look a little bit genealogically, it just establishes itself uh, as a how say counterbalance with this fight with some sort of foundationalism. And even more ironic, in the end of your talk, you, you mentioned Kant as a bad guy, and of course in the beginning, the bad guy for analytic philosophy was Kant. You see, so now things. <laughs> Things are, are mixed in that way, and uh, uh, I, and I think that if we really want to get out of this, what Hegel would call maybe some <coughs> kind of bad infinity, right, of of uh, accusing opponents of foundationalism and then establishing another foundationalism, right, and, and turning in these circles, we at least should evaluate a little bit this. How say foundationalism, and I think when, when you when you propose basically this um, how say sociological and critical approach with Mark Engels, I, I don't think you should disregard the fact that those guys turned how or oh, some other people turned their philosophy into the worst form of foundationalism ever known. And I think that that's also, and I think you are in the right place in this institute, right? To, to study this kind of thing. So it's not even traditional foundationalism, but situation when it's like uh, Ilya mentioned, uh, people who just pay by their lives for kind of wrong, wrong words, you see? Yeah. So. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> you want to respond to that or just let it pass? Uh, no, I'm, I'm taking it on, on, on board. Uh, uh, I mean, what I, what I think was revolutionary in, in Marx and Engels is the concept of ideology, um, and 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 really what they saw as I idealism. I think when you re when you reread those texts, um, forget about everything else. When you reread those texts, and when you read today the way that um, there is the philosophy of science on the other on the one hand, and then there is the practice of science on the other. I, for me, it's obvious idealism is there, and the fa and and. Whatever happens to science and to history and to the critique, you know, knowledge and power, nothing touches on, on that a very abstract thing that philosophers of science do. And when you ask them, you know, what is, it that inform, what is it that informs your own thought? What is it that I can tell you that would make you change your mind? Nothing you can tell them. Nothing you can change, show them in reality will change their mind because what is true or, or not true for them is based on logical and linguistic validity. It's, it's their own... Um, and I think Marx and Engels were, were, were very good at you know, showing that. Uh, whether they established another foundationalism, I'm, I'm not responsible uh, for that particular part. But I think that movement was, was truly um, a, ver it was a very important revolutionary movement. And I think Mannheim understood it better, for instance, than the you know, Frankfurt School critical theorist who said, no, 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 we don't want to go into a sociology of knowledge because something has to be sacred, right? 
so Marxism, you know, Marxism has to be sacred, otherwise everything becomes relative. And Mannheim said, yes, with all confidence, you can, you can acknowledge the, the historicity of thought without completely dissolving your ability to speak about reality. So if you want to call this foundationalism, I don't know, but... But, yeah. but also in order of reflexivity, but just to develop this critique within some traditional British academic environment. Right? And so, so it functions there. And if you imagine how so you're thinking the environment like it was here yeah. in this building, yeah. it's only time, it's something else. Right? Mm. Thank you very much for yeah. why I enjoyed it. Uh, but the question is, social epistemology, did you speak as someone coming from Wales, but it's Wales epistemology, you came from the United Kingdom, so it's a United Kingdom philosophy, which you, uh, and so on. <coughs> the, uh, but you try to generalize it, you are speaking for the world as it is at the moment. And uh, what I'm missing is, uh, is it, if, uh, uh, Social epistemology is the queen discipline, so to say, the king discipline. Is there a priori behind? You only accept the refraction. This is not enough. Uh, for you have to ask for the sources of uh, the contents of refraction. Is it uh, now superfluous uh, what Kant said, even if we you know it's much too narrow, uh, and we would uh, reflect on it? But uh, by means of the social epistemology alone, you wouldn't be really on the track of epistemology. You need, and my question is, how does it fit together with a priori knowledge and to the background of a priori conditions of knowledge? We, uh, I missed that. Thank you. Um, I hope I understood the question correctly. Yes, you still have to have some kind of some kind of starting point or assumptions, but they are not fixed. They, there is a, there is a, a, I mean, you still have to believe in social science, obviously, to turn social science against itself. To do a theory of knowledge, you have to believe that there is such a thing as a theory of knowledge. But it is most consistent because it applies the tools of critique to the knowledge that you're producing. And it is from that that you extract the standards for knowledge. So it's never about an a priori standard. It's always about constantly reassessing the standards that you've chosen on the basis of this um, very unique singular interaction, if you want, between the thoughts that you're producing and the knowledge that we are, un you know, wh whatever knowledge that we're better gaining about reality and about knowledge itself. I'm not saying it's perfect, or that it's absolutely, it's a different kind of logic. It's a different kind of, uh, you have to redefine progress within that thing. But it's certainly much better than a completely abstracted, imaginary way of thinking. It's just imaginary. It's just someone invented it and said, now we have to think. Epistemology wasn't like this. It, there are many different forms or different meanings of epistemology, ontology, methodology, and different cultures, I mean, in, in the, how it was established in the German case and in the French case and in the English case, etc. And they've been reduced to something very peculiar, which didn't exist as such because, precisely, there, there still was a unity of thought and practice. Practice was very important. And maybe trying to understand why thought and practice have, been, have become so separated, and I think the Marxist tradition here has, has contributed, someone like Alfred Zonrete, who said, well, abstraction itself can be, can be explained mater materially or socio-historically because it is a product of capitalism. And it, and it emerges in, you know, he identifies exactly the birth of the concept in Greek philosophy and what makes it possible is, is, is the birth of money. So this, these are interesting hypotheses that we should develop more because they tell us that the way we know reality is the product of reality. This is pretty scary. It means we're just in a bubble thinking that we're discovering something new, but in fact we're just reflecting in the sense of a mirror, the reality of which Can we're Can I ask part. you a question about this which relates to the, the implicit ontology of the social that you're operating with? Because when we talk about knowledge being socially situated, we could be talking about the social in various dimensions. I mean, you began your comment by drawing attention to this. So, for example, one could talk about 
uh, Homo sapiens is socially situated by nature. And since you are willing to entertain a certain kind of naturalism, um, I'm just saying, why can't we say we're socially situated not just in being, you know, you know, in Wales or the UK yeah. or Europe, but in being in Homo sapiens or being yeah. in the planet, yeah. right? To go to some of these cosmos guys that Ilya was talking about, right? They were so, they believed in social situatedness, but it was a social situatedness in the biosphere, mm. and in that sense, we're all socially situated in the same respect because we're all on the same planet, yeah. right? And 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 what would presumably that could also count as socially situated? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, see, yeah. but then it does raise an issue about what what hangs on the word social here, right? What what is it? I mean, is it is is the social just a marker for anti-classical epistemology? You see, and anything that's anti-classical epistemology, as you've defined it, is social epistemology, and so it includes everything, you know, from ethnomethodology to evolutionary biology. I mean, that's quite a broad... I'm not particularly attached to the term social, and I think we should interrogate it as well. Well, when we talk about situatedness, this is kind of the term that gets well, used. Well, even situatedness is, is, I think, also very imperfect. Um, yeah, but if you're going to talk about epistemic agents, they've got to, in some sense, be somewhere, be embodied, yeah. especially in your theory, because you want to make sure theory and practice don't get split apart again. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, there's got to be a theory of embodiment here, and that's where the social presumably does some work, but if it's such a big notion, then it becomes clear, it becomes unclear where where the epistemic a agency is happening. Right. Right? I mean, uh, uh, the gentleman in the back was uh, had his hand up first, and then we'll go to the rest. Yeah. Um, you said something very interesting about evolution, and you referred to Lamarck and Darwin, and it strikes me that there's a fundamental difference in Newtonian scientific practice or the scientific practice, the regularity theory of you, establishing knowledge through regular successions of events, and the science, if it was science, that Darwin did, or indeed the Lamarck actually was slightly different, I guess, but um, I suppose my question is, how do you understand Darwin's work as scientific? You know, the whole business of looking at relations of between species, how is that scientific in the same frame as a Newtonian or a, or a Humean um, established through event regularities? Does it have to be within the same frame? I mean, the French tradition of historical epistemology precisely uh, breaks that idea that it, it's one science, one method, one way of thinking scientifically. And this is why they actually looked at specific sciences, specific knowledges, so that once, for instance, Bachelard looked at physics and chemistry, Canguillem looked at biology, Foucault looked at psychiatry. Um, I don't have an answer to this question, but at the same time, I'm thinking, who decided that there was one frame for science and that we should compare them that way? Um, and I think that it, it becomes obvious even within the same discipline, once you're comparing, you know, uh, Newtonian physics to Aristotelian physics and saying, oh, how do we compare them? There is no single frame of reference to compare them. Okay, but I'm worried then about what you're throwing away. Which is what? I mean, I'm, I'm not... Something about empiricism. Something about empiricism. What about empiricism? It's, it's the process whereby we come to knowledge about the world through the experiences that we have. The processes whereby we abstract um, theories about things that happen around us, the way our expectations are changed, and the way our expectations are met. Because that, to me, that's, that's what the empiricist tries to establish. I, I don't think I'm throwing it away. On the contrary, I think that once you understand that what we call science or scientific theorizing is in fact the product of that specific practice you're talking about. Um, then you have to, um, you know, this becomes central. I don't think you th it doesn't become marginal or out of the whole picture on the contrary. And I think it makes even more sense of the social sciences, which we have completely idealized in the way that we teach them. Um, and I always go back to Emile Durkheim as, as a perfect example of this. 
that even within the same discipline and the same author, even in the same mind of someone who has established rules for doing social science, if you take two of his, of his seminal books, Suicide and The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, there is nothing in common in the method. There is absolutely nothing in common because he, because it, you know, for each method was specific to the object and the way of conceptualizing it. So I'm, I'm against the, the unique frame, and I think it, and, and I agree with the French tradition that says that it's really in the actual obstacles, the technical obstacles of interacting with with reality, that science emerges. That this is how it pro it doesn't go from theory to application. It goes really from this, and this is why I think the best theorists are the ones who are empiricists. We've and got to move from this point. I want to take two more questions because we want to make sure the other speaker. Okay, so two brief questions. And brief Don't, answers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to be said, but I want to just, okay, please promise me, brief, brief. You, will you be brief? <laughs> I know this woman. <laughs> You need, you need, you need a microphone. Can you hear you? Please, what is your attitude to the idea of such kind? Maybe uh, <coughs> this border which exists between social, between social um, conditions of the emergence of knowledge and the knowledge itself scientific knowledge itself, maybe this border is moving now inside, inside the knowledge, inside the scientific knowledge. And here, this confrontation of these two things uh, is um, the moving force of the development of science, maybe so. And uh, maybe, uh, all com very complex <coughs> social um, relationships about which Professor Fuller was uh, saying today very interesting and his analysis was very profound. Uh, maybe it is possible to see the reason of all of these relationships in the process and in the changes which are taking place now in the knowledge itself, in the scientific knowledge, in its logical structure, mm. in its content, and so on. Maybe this is the main feature of social epistemology. Mm. Because scientific knowledge, science, mm. always was mm, under the influence of the society. It is nothing uh, nothing new in this idea, you see. But maybe these social elements are now inside the, the scientific knowledge. What is your attitude to such idea? Thank you. Again, if I understood this, I think it's also related to the question about the social, right? Um, the way I'm thinking now about the problem, again, if I understood correctly, if it relates to that, the problem I have, um, which is that if, if knowledge is society, basically, and society is knowledge, there, there isn't a separation in terms of causality of what produces what. Um, and the whole issue of co-production, co-constitution, I think, is, is, is just blurring the problems instead of actually addressing them. Um, I don't know how to address that because if you... Analytically, it's easy because you can identify two things, right? So you can say one of them is inside the other or they are acting on one another. In a more dialectical way, which is, I think, the right way to go. We, can, we, can, we yeah. really need to... Yeah, I... I, I, I no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. It's a question. tough question, yeah. It is, and, and, I'm, and I'm afraid I'm going to make this the last question just so we make sure we have the other speaker give him enough time. There's a, there, I know there were several of you with your hands up. I'm sorry about this, but so we can keep the time. It's a work in progress, so... I, I, and she'll I'm be done. around, by the way. You can, you can ask her all kinds of questions privately. To which I probably won't have the answers. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very thank much, you. Inanna. It was thank great. You.